From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Lunch, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and your family are safe and secure, sheltering in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to enjoying your company back at the Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. Our speaker today was born in rural Pennsylvania and came to San Francisco in 1980. From 80 to 84, he worked in the shipyards, he worked in, as a doorman in yacht clubs, and most importantly, he worked for Butterfield and Butterfield. From 1984 until 2002, he took a long hiatus where he worked as a roadie and as a driver and as a stage manager for Miles Davis and Chick Corea and Neil Young and Metallica and other famous, famous uh, folks in the rock and roll business, he worked for other famous performers in the rock and roll business. And then in 2002, he and his wife, Marty, started Shine and Shine Antique Books and Maps on Grand Street in San Francisco. Uh, post pandemic, they now have Shine and Shine Antique Books and Maps uh, and, and Rare Photographs now online out of Sonoma. So it's with great pleasure that we welcome you back to the Lindsay Audience Luncheon. Uh, it's, it's so fun to have um, you in our presence, Jimmy Shine. Um, tell us all about uh, Gold Mountain, Big City, and really the story of Chinese settlement in San Francisco and ultimately America. San Francisco's Chinatown, as I've learned from you, was the original settlement of Chinese folks in uh, this new world. That's right, Ron. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me. This is a phenomenal opportunity. I enjoy these Zoom presentations and uh, speaking for the St. Francis Yacht Club is always a great privilege. I love these luncheons. Uh, I do have a uh, apple cider poured uh, on the rocks uh, in celebration of the appropriate uh, beverage for such an occasion. Um, also, uh, I've got a little bit of sun uh, in my face and a little wind at my back, so it's a good day. Um, uh, I'm really very happy to be here. Uh, uh, the serendipity of the occasion uh, does fall uh, just a couple of days before uh, Gung Hei Fa Choi, uh, New Year's or Chinese New Year's as we call it locally, uh, the New Year of the Lunar Calendar. And, uh, and with that comes uh, some celebration of all things Chinese. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, got me here is a story about um, a man and his creation of maps just in lieu of an introduction about the book that has come about, Gold Mountain, Big City. Um, I'll hold it up next to my face here and you can see that the map itself is behind me. Uh, the story is about a map. The map was made by a map maker, a man who lived in San Francisco from about 1937 to 1985. Uh, which time he passed away. Um, the collection came to us when Marty and I opened the store. We had neighbors coming out of the woodwork. And one of them, a woman by the name of Laura Dorenzo, came to us and said, I have a bunch of maps in the basement and you should come and buy them from us. And so we investigated this and indeed, she had an amazing amount of maps in the basement and we did buy them from her. And uh, we took everything she had. We cleared out the basement, one of these longshoremen cribs filled with all kinds of things uh, on the Montgomery Street steps. So we discovered we had two piles. One was a pile of maps that were essentially reference material. And the other was a pile of maps that were created by one man, a man whom we discovered was named Ken Cathcart or Kenneth Cathcart. And uh, with that, we had some idea of what we had. That brings us to the creation of said book. Uh, the book is a book about a map and a map maker, and we hope that it's one of several books. Cathcart had seven maps that covered San Francisco and California history, and I chose Chinatown to start with because it was the one least familiar to me as a San Franciscan and some of the nuances of the stories. So with that, we have Gold Mountain Big City, Ken Cathcart's 1947 illustrated map of San Francisco's Chinatown. I had my friend Gordon Chin doing a forward on it, and of course, uh, I worked on this with uh, staff and my wife for a couple of years before we found a publisher and sent it on its way. 
Chapter one starts with our map maker, and here we have a selfie of Cathcart in about 1942 at home visiting his mother who had retired to Sacramento. Um, in uh, 1937, he arrives in San Francisco at the age of 35, and on Christmas 37, he does us the great service with the gift of a new camera, a Leica. He documents the day and a typical composition by an art student. This newspaper dated December 27th, 1937, gives us a reference and context for the beginning of Cathcart's life in San Francisco. Soon after his arrival, and very soon after arrival, he meets B.S. Fong. B.S. Fong is the president and acting manager for the Consolidated uh, Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, otherwise known as the Six Companies. At this time, there is the Second Sino-Japanese War, and the Six Companies is host to the China War Relief Association of America, a benevolent society raising funds for refugees from 1936 until 1958 through the Six Companies. Cathcart is hired, in fact, to document the collecting of donations and the creation of war relief events to raise funds for those who are in Manchuria under the encroachment of a colonial Japan at this time. It merits mentioning this would have a friction in the town of San Francisco and in Chinatown, where if you are of Asian descent, you were required to live within Chinatown, even if you were Japanese or Malayan or Philippine. Thus, there was some neighborhood friction which Cathcart is documenting. Despite this, Cathcart, as a uh, European American coming from the rural South, arriving in San Francisco at the age of 35, is uh, taking a very soft hue. And we see that he's made homage to uh, Charles Doby and Arthur Sidham's book, uh, Chinatown, published in 35, a couple of years before his arrival. It's the first publication to really celebrate Chinatown and the community that it was in a positive light. Prior to this period, the impact of the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, and villainization through media and press for a couple of generations presents us with very little positive. So Cathcart is hired to show local activities and local people and local events that transpire and use this as part of the promotion of the community, as well as the privilege of just seeing life on the streets. Cathcart's greatest engagement might be with newspaper men like Chinua Li. Chinua Li and William Hoy are perhaps the greatest academics of Chinese American ancestry and supporters and owners of the China Digest. Um, their documents and their life story is well documented now, 70 years later, but this time these men would have been working newspaper men fighting for freedom of speech and expression in Chinatown, a community of people who are from Canton, Guangdong, uh, and ultimately many people uh, coming from a similar common political background. Um, the Chinese Digest was uh, on Nine Cameron Place, and other places that Cathcart is documenting through his photographic collection, giving us an explanation of his life, is Stidger and Stidger. Um, and here we see them in Suite 240 of the Montgomery Block. Stidger and Stidger are the preeminent immigration lawyers for all issues in regards to the import and export of goods and people to and from China. The honest representation of a Chinese in individual in this country is nary zero in the years from 1883 to 1943. And in these years, if there is any such acts to be transpired within and outside the community of Chinatown, it would have been Stidger and Stidger for two generations who provided said services. This introduction was rather auspicious because it obviously facilitated housing. This is the building in which Stidger and Stidger's offices were. This is also the location of which Ken Cathcart would move in 1938, the original Montgomery block, the present site of the Transamerica Pyramid. This building was the first fireproof building in San Francisco and ultimately is the north east corner of the financial district going into the Barbary Coast in San Francisco's North Beach and Chinatown. It is at the apex and conjuncture of these locations that Cathcart lands in room 428 on the fourth floor in the courtyard room for almost 20 years, living uh, for $14 a month rent as one of the many uh, artists living in this building, including 75 WPA supported Work Progress Administration supported artists who are getting federal subsidies as writers and authors and poets and painters and muralists. 
Cathcart is in this map showing us uh, daily life for him as an artist. And we find that some of the immediate uh, items to the proximity of his building, his building being the 1853 MB uh, in the lower right hand corner, uh, we see the Philosopher's Inn and Bonini's Barn and Papa Copa number one and Papa Copa number two. These, in fact, are all the eateries within the neighborhood that are uh, not just uh, great uh, literary establishments, which are the hangouts of people like George Sterling and Jack London, uh, aspirations of which Cathcart had great and many, uh, but also places where he would have gone daily to uh, service his, his own needs for, for, for food. Um, and that living in the Montgomery block uh, did not allow or have a kitchen. And so he, like many people, lived in the neighborhood. Cathcart's neighborhood uh, predated him by many years. In the Montgomery block, we have uh, the invention of Pisco Punch, a well-beloved San Francisco drink, not as common or popular today, uh, but certainly here was it invented. Uh, and this plaque would have been on the building in which he lived and he would have passed it every day. Uh, the drink was served here until Prohibition. And here, in fact, we have the last day, the closing night at the Bankers Exchange in the Montgomery block. And those are some sad fellas. Uh, all uh, having their last drink. Um, Cathcart's acknowledgement of both Chinatown and the Barbary Coast are greatly influenced by previous writers. And um, here we see a little icon on the map uh, about Herbert Asbury's Barbary Coast. The Barbary Coast would have been a rather, is a great Baudry's tale, and he's also the author of Gangs of New York. But the Barbary Coast would have been a historic tale for Cathcart at this time, because while he's living in the Montgomery block from 1938 to 1958, the neighborhood that we see documented on the map around his building, for the most part, is that of a neighborhood uh, from 1850 to uh, 1890. Um, so it is truly a historic viewpoint, and some of it goes up to maybe 1915, but in fact, the Barbary Coast that Cathcart lives next to has been abandoned and derelict. Um, prohibition and the repeal of prostitution, the inability for any of these joints to do what they had done historically for 100 years, had by this time shut down and derelict. And so for us, uh, Cathcart's map of uh, the Barbary Coast on this is rather historic, whereas his map of Chinatown is in the moment. Um, uh, speaking of which, and just a quick aside, here we actually have on the same roll of film as the previous shots was these shots of Telegraph Hill and Alta Street. And by coincidence, uh, the third building down on the right is, uh, would be his eventual home some 20 years after the taking of this photograph. And whether it was intentional or whether it happened, uh, we don't know. But this is in fact the building that these photographs and the map and all of the information relating to this collection were stored until it came to us uh, through the woman who lived uh, in the house up the street right here. Uh, and it was stored a total of 45 years before it came to us. But Cathcart knew that he was someplace that had been documented before, and he was a historian and an appreciator of a good story and the truth. And so with that in his um, invasion, excuse me, <laughs> with his invitation uh, to Chinatown, and it was a Freudian slip almost to, to say his invasion, um, he was an invited guest uh, by the six companies and by the community at large. Um, and we found that his documentation was uh, taken with an eye as a sensitive documentarian. And it may in part be because of his understanding of a map like this. Um, this is the 1885 Chinatown map done uh, as the official map of Chinatown in San Francisco by the Special Committee of the Board of Supervisors of the City of San Francisco, uh, produced in July of 1885. This was a map where we have a color code and the color code shows that it's uh, uh, tan for general Chinese occupancy, uh, pink for Chinese gambling houses, green for Chinese prostitution, yellow for Chinese opium resorts, uh, red for Chinese joss houses, and blue for white prostitution. Um, none of the activities I've listed were illegal in 1895, but all were considered immoral. And as such, the map was a map of exclusion, justifying a law from two years earlier, created both statewide and then federally, to exclude, exclude Chinese immigrants from basic civil rights. This map is well known to the Chinese community, and it is the basis of all maps that color code or document land through this process. Um, this map was unknown uh, to many, 
And so we made copies and we produce it and we have it out in the book. And, uh, and it was a novelty. It was also a map that showed uh, the things not to do in Chinatown, but it also was a map that, it, that uh, showed the uh, moral justification for the exclusion of Chinese immigrants from basic civil rights. Um, with that came maps thereafter that Cathcart would have found and studied, like this 1892 map promoted by the chamber, uh, showing land use and names, but uh, in a favorable sense and simply explaining the business's merit. Here we have one by J.P. Wong that does the same kind of thing, but shows the growth of Chinatown and the Chinese community's growth, both in Marin and in the East Bay, as well as representation, albeit not great, through Angel Island in the process of uh, immigration through that island. Uh, in that process, the immigrant was thus counted. And prior to this time, uh, there was no process to be counted if you are being excluded. If you cannot testify in a court of law, nor marry, nor own land, um, all of these uh, issues about being counted don't matter. Um, so uh, having an immigration station was the beginning of cracks in the process that started to, ch to challenge uh, the exclusion of immigrants from China based on that sole basis. Um, Cathcart in his own time would have been very familiar with this map, which would have been produced the year that he's working for the War Relief Association. In 1939, we have a fair in the middle of the bay and build Treasure Island. We put a fair on it, the Golden Gate International Exposition. And with that, Ethel Chung has been asked to produce a map by the Chamber of Commerce to promote uh, Chinatown. And we see the map is whimsical and bright colored and we see lots of fantastic icons. And what we see is that it doesn't have to be geographically correct. It has Grant Avenue going up to the ferry building pretty much, but uh, irrelevant. Uh, it's a way of getting people and celebrating. In fact, it's a style that even the guidebook itself for the Golden Gate International Exposition is in the same style of map. And these are illustrated or cartoon maps. And this one also is played down compared to most of most of Ruth Taylor White's uh, creations. But with it, she uh, is popularizing uh, a style that Cathcart, by the end of the Second World War, has decided he is going to become a map maker. He has been rejected as an author, and he is going to do this process. And so here we see his 1946 map of California in the gold region, um, a beautiful map with tons and tons and tons of icons, just like the Chinatown map. And then here we have Cathcart's 1947 San Francisco Chinatown and Environs, a scrapbook map. So the scrapbook map comes from the term uh, truly like scrapbooking. And that all of these images, uh, the little animations, the little characters, the buildings, the people, are drawn at about a six inch to 12 inch height. And they're reduced photolithographically and then cut out and then overlaid and then photoed and then cut out and overlaid and reduced and expanded. And, and this is a process of scrapbooking and uh, very labor intensive and archaic, but most modern for the time for the mid 20th century. Um, and with that came the ability to create great depth. Uh, Cathcart had uh, the foresight to see the need to break a map down. And he created this one with um, uh, uh, 177 images inside of 89 spaces. The second chapter of my book has a typo that doesn't articulate that well, and it's hard to say. Fact is, is you've got a border of 26 icons and then an inner map of great detail of everyday Chinatown life of another 150 or more icons in Chinese American stories or stories of the Barbary Coast. So with that, we have a very, very in-depth, very creative, very colorful map that we've uh, created an, uh, an XY grid of A through G and one through nine uh, to intersect on street intersections, allowing us to break down and define each block and the icons within it. And so the map you can kind of jump around on and pick an icon and go to B4 in the book and get an explanation of what that is. It's a book that can give, uh, chapter reading as well as individual reading. We start chapter two with the uh, outer grid, which is the story of Chinese American life in California. And uh, this story is really 1847 to 1947, the time of the publication of the map. And so it is indeed a centennial and also a celebration that in 1943, for the first time, 
uh, in essence, the first uh, efforted repeal of parts of the Chinese Exclusion Act were successful um, after many years of effort by a great number of people that we may touch upon later who are documented in the map. So with the outer border, we have a, a touch upon Chinese American life and the immigrant coming into the United States. Uh, and uh, it starts with the Chinese Republic and the Manchu Empire. The Chinese Republic would be the Republic of Dr. Sun Yat-sen and created on October 10th of 1911. And the Manchu Empire, the Qin Dynasty as it's known, would have been the outgoing. And as we see, we see some discrepancy in dates because of course things never go as one would think uh, day to day and exact timing. Uh, it was of course several months after the creation of the Chinese Republic that in fact the Manchu Empire declared uh, it was ceased. Um, but these are the nuances and the accuracies of Cathcart in the celebration of the community that is Chinatown. We have 1010 10 parades today and, and October 10th is still a day of celebration in the Chinatown of San Francisco. Um, here we see Chiang Kai-shek in about 1939, who at this time would have been the president of the Republic of China, um, and then ultimately uh, celebrating that. We can see a nice October day here on Grant Avenue. Um, C, D, F, and G are uh, icons that I touch on and explain a little bit in the outer border because they represent the four trades that were allowed under the Chinese Exclusion Act. So these were items that one could do if you were of Chinese ancestry. Uh, C being a merchant and San Francisco's Chinese community um, had a great number of merchants and this was a historic uh, boon over the long term for San Francisco's Chinatown. But here we see a, a, a 1890s postcard uh, and if we compare that to a 1920s photograph where we see uh, Bing Tong on his store on Grant Avenue. Um, Bing Tong I mentioned because he was one of the presidents and uh, elders of the six companies and ultimately a uh, a person of note in the community. Um, so it's nice to see uh, the comparisons of, uh, of that generation. And then also for Cathcart's time, we have the new merchant, and this would be a woman working in uh, retail on Grant Avenue and owning the businesses. And this would be very modern fashion, very contemporary, sophisticated person. Um, Cathcart is documenting these things. He's documenting laborers, and laborers is the D job. It's the job of uh, digging ditches, but it's also restaurant work and laundry work. Um, and then, of course, there's the farmer, and he has uh, Delta farmers and their farms, and then a teacher or a scholar. And in Chinatown, we see underground, we see music, uh, we see here's a Freemason uh, intellectual, uh, and people of the traditional garb are often uh, intellectuals and free thinkers. Uh, this is uh, the primary goal of Cathcart is uh, he's taking from real life. And so we see all of the icons on the outer border emulate photos that he has uh, gotten in everyday life, uh, documenting that and putting it in context of now and its hi historic place. Um, here we see the dragon dancers and the unpacking of the crate. And here we have a postcard of the dragon set up and the feeding of the dragon uh, probably from 1910 or 1904, um, but he even has a photograph of a very similar looking dragon uh, on display at the Golden Gate International Exposition out on Treasure Island in, in part of the China building in uh, 1939. He also takes uh, important cues from the community and, and important structures like the telephone exchange. And so here his icon very much emulates the uh, postcard of pre-earthquake San Francisco's telephone exchange. This building was uh, built, custom hand built in Canton. It, it was a post and beam structure. It was disassembled, sailed here, and constructed solely for the purpose of creating a phone exchange. At a time prior to rotary or phone tone dialing, um, you had to dial an operator, and that operator would connect you to where you wanted to go, uh, to that other person. And there was an individual involved in every phone call you made. In the case of exclusion, the Chinese were excluded from interacting, but they could have phones, a modern technology. And so this building was constructed and brought here. It's an important building because um, inside, uh, prior to the earthquake, it was men. And after the earthquake, it was women. 
these individuals would take incoming calls and in a matter of milliseconds uh, process who it was you were asking for, where they lived, what the relationship was to others, whether they had a phone, how you would find them, and how to patch them through, uh, all in a matter of moments. Uh, the knowledge and spatial memory was impressive. And prior to the, as I mentioned, prior to the earthquake, um, it was men and afterwards it was women. And although this building was rumored to have been burned down, and in fact was saved in many parts because we see that the banister and the switchboard itself are identical before and after the great earthquake and fire in postcards, despite the change in, person, in personnel, excuse me. Um, Cathcart is also taking the time to acknowledge traditional dress in this border. And traditional dress is relevant because it is just a generation away for his time. And here again, we have the family of Bing Tong. And this is about 1908, uh, prior to the family going to China for a year or two <clears throat> for a visit to see family and perhaps the last time. Um, we see the children, uh, there are uh, seven kids uh, flanked on the left by, uh, by Jenny and flanked on the right by Lily. Uh, these young women uh, grew up to be San Franciscans and to be educated at Stanford, uh, ultimately uh, going to China. But what we find upon their return, uh, the family has shrunk and that they've lost a couple of children to disease in China. And the style of dress and the modernity of dress has changed greatly. And so uh, we see that uh, the loss of that traditionalism is something Cathcart acknowledges. And it also is a celebration of the culture and the richness and depth of culture, uh, as well as the uh, assimilation that is taking place and loss of that in some regard. Um, with that comes also things like the old temple on Waverly Place, a Buddhist Taoist temple, uh, considered the oldest in the United States now, uh, having been originally set up in the 1850s, uh, burned in the 1906 earthquake and fire, uh, but rebuilt, uh, still there today and still available for the public to visit, um, but documented in previous and established protocols in the celebration of Chinatown. Here we see a 1892 promotional of early Chinatown. We see the original on the left is the original uh, Joss House or temple, and on the right is the inside grounds. Cathcart's photographs, these are actually from his own reference material, but um, he is uh, coming and acknowledging his predecessors. And with uh, a postcard I show you on the left and the individual illustration he created on the right, um, he's really paying homage to Arnold Gente and Frank Irwin, who wrote a book about old Chinatown and actually in 1908, a book that had the best photographs of Chinatown to that point. And for the first time, we're presenting the Chinese community in a humanist and gentle and um, sincere kind fashion. It may have been patronizing and he may not have been um, approved to take some of the photos uh, ultimately, but the, the publication itself is revered and celebrated as the first humanization of a community that to this point uh, for a couple of generations has been demonized or villainized. Um, with that, Cathcart uh, is acknowledging uh, the children uh, in the neighborhood uh, who these are in many cases the children of the merchants with Cathcart has met uh, over the course of his uh, promotions for the War Relief Association. Um, that takes us into chapter three, which tells us about the uh, inner uh, workings of daily life historically and every day in Chinatown. Um, chapter three is 151 icons and it's explained through the grid of A through G and one through nine. And it's made to be approached, uh, you can read it straight through or you can jump around. Um, and I've just decided to take a kind of a sampling to give an idea of what's represented and what the core value of the map is and why we felt so pleased um, with the production. And, and once we really start to understand it, how happy we are about that. Um, it's uh, 151 icons and uh, it's about old and new city. And again, we have the acknowledgement of it being a scrapbook map. Um, little subtleties, that little horse and carriage up there in the left-hand corner, that in fact is the first uh, rail car in San Francisco. It ran along Montgomery Street and, uh, and ultimately was a horse-drawn uh, train car on a track. Uh, but this was common prior to cable cars. This is how uh, we got around. Um, 
In the four corners of the inner map, we have Chinese gaming. And gaming in Chinatown is important because uh, prior to the 1970s or so in this country, um, all gaming was illegal except for in Las Vegas. And uh, that was with a wink and a nudge, most likely. But the fact is, is that it was a crime and it was prosecuted. Um, that was not as much the case in Chinatown. Uh, Chinatown may have been grifted off of a bit by white prostitution and uh, the police of the time. Uh, but for the most part, the Chinese American community in Chinatown was in control of its own gaming. Um, and I say that because uh, things like the lottery were, uh, they paid. If you won, they paid. And uh, so they had a legitimacy and people outside of Chinatown played this game. Um, something like chess is something more, and Fantan are more historical games. When we talk about Mahjong, that's a regional game and a game that just is uh, played where the piece names have uh, colloquial names that are regional. And because of that, if you come from a particular region of China, you might hang out with people from that region because you have the same uh, names for the pieces in the game. And this is one of the commonalities. Uh, so these are the games that uh, uh, thread Chinatown together in a positive manner and some of the enjoyments that he would see every day on the streets, as we do. He'd also have historic contributors on the map um, because he is a historian and he wants to place uh, the acknowledgement of 100 years of uh, support of the community here in San Francisco. And so the first 49ers, which would have been the Chinese who went to the gold camps, um, or the merchants of the 1850s, which was the first Chinese immigrant to come with something more than just the labor or the clothes on their back. They actually had a wealth and the ability to create wealth and import and export goods. And in doing so, San Francisco's Chinatown was very fortunate that a great number of its community members were in fact merchants with this goal. And this goal of commercial success aligned greatly with American capitalism. And over time, these two coalesced quite well. So so the acknowledgement of this then and now was very important. Even if the costume is um, a little patronizing or perhaps inappropriate to some degree with the severity of the shoes and the uh, subtleties of things. But the fact is, is it's an honest and uh, uh, happy kind of inclusion. Uh, we also have things like uh, Emperor Joshua Norton. And Emperor Norton was a, a great local character who uh, essentially declared himself the Emperor of the uh, United States and Protectorate of Mexico after losing his mind. Um, he was a rice commodities broker who got, went bust. And the great rumors about him is that he lived in the Odd Fellows Hall or that he lived on Sacramento Street. And, and Cathcart took great pride in debunking that and showing that he lived at 624 Commercial Street. And here we have Norton holding that house apparently in his arms. And it's a rather charming anecdote, but it's inclusive of a history that was very close to his heart and, and within a block or two of where he lived. Um, but he's really documenting in a greater part within this map, everyday people. And we see things like the modern slit skirt. And ultimately here we see a merchant and her partner uh, on Waverly Place with the Chan building in the background, uh, walking to work um, in very much uh, a skirt as desired and designed uh, and described. So uh, very fun. Um, also, people of merit, um, right in the middle of the map, we see Dr. Ng Poon Chu. And this is going to the heart of the community of the political philosophy of Chinatown at the time and its origins, and that the majority of people come from Canton and a region of Canton specifically, where so does Dr. Sun Yat-sen and, and General Chiang Kai-shek. Um, this part of China um, is the origins and the birthplace of the Chinese uh, Republic and uh, the Chinese constitution as created by Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Um, Dr. Ng Poon Chu essentially was an advocate for the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act and a very strong advocate for support of Dr. Sun Yat-sen in the creation of the Chinese Republic in 1912. Remembering that Sun Yat-sen actually lived in San Francisco under the direction and protection of the Freemason, the Chinese Freemason here, um, because there was a bounty on his head from the Qin Dynasty as a revolutionary and treasonous. Um, uh, the Chinese constitution as we know it for the Chinese Republic was written in the Montgomery block by Dr. Sun Yat-sen with the help of Stinger and Stinger. These are all 
parts of Cathcart's serendipity of locale and placement that gave him great insight. And so understanding the importance of Dr. Ng Poon Chu and his newspaper, the Chung Sai Yat Po, Chinese language newspaper, uh, advocating and speaking strongly for uh, both uh, the freedom of Chinese in the United States as well as the support of the Chinese democracy. Um, we also see then the statue of Dr. Sun Yat-sen in, in St. Mary's Park, and Benny Bufano created that statue. And here we to the left of it, we see Benny Bufano. And it turns out that Benny Bufano knew Sun Yat-sen, and they met sometime and uh, had an interaction. And Bufano loved making large works, and San Francisco has many. Uh, St. Francis is one of them. Uh, we've seen the seals and the dolphins and the penguins. Um, this one was in fact uh, and is still there. Um, St. Mary's Park has changed in that the slope is off and now there's a parking garage underneath it yet. Uh, this icon remains. Um, it is a stainless steel and stone structure. But it turns out the Cathcart, not only did Benny Bufano know Sun Yat-sen, Benny Bufano knew Ken Cathcart. And here we have Cathcart photo of Bufano looking up at his statue in about 1942. So this is very fun. These are nice serendipities. Cathcart's also documenting something that we would take for granted today. And it's Trey Man. It's not a name I've ever heard before, and it's not anything we'd ever uh, apply. But what we see is an individual with a tray of dim sum on his head. He has a traditional cue, and it's perhaps a historical viewpoint. But when we look at his photographic record, which is our, in fact, source for all of this, we see that he has no less than 20 photographs of men in exact such situations, where they, in fact, are carrying uh, lunch on their head. So research comes to comes to tell us, in fact, that so many people worked such long days, they really could not take time off for work. And this was a norm. And so food was brought to you. And this was also a norm. Well, this was a norm only in Chinatown and only in San Francisco and New York did we ever have any delivery food. And it was only Chinese. And only did it probably start in the 1960s that we had any food delivered at all. And that would have been pizza. Uh, so at a time when we live at home and we're kind of restricted and, and delivery is a great service if it's available, we probably should understand that prior to this, it would have been unheard of, um, the idea of prepared foods at all being brought anywhere um, was novel, uh, but certainly to have it delivered to you. So Trey Man is a really relevant piece, and I like having him in there, and I, the book has a nice little homage to him. Um, with the rest of the story, we really see... The Cathcart is showing really the center and the heart of the community from the buildings and family associations on Waverly Place, which have been documented in photographs by people like Carlton Watkins. Here we have the last block with the Chan building in the background as the far end. And here we are looking a little bit different angle during his time again with the Chan building in the background. So he knows where he is. Um, and he is documented in a place that has schools like Commodore Stockton School. And we see, in fact, on his map, right next to the Chinese hospital. And the Chinese hospital, which has just been replaced and just reconstructed to about four times larger than it was before. But this is a very important site. This building was constructed solely and exclusively by Chinese immigrants and Chinese Americans within Chinatown to have a hospital that would service them because there was none other. If you're of Chinese ancestry under the Chinese Exclusion Act, you were denied services at all hospitals. If you had to go, you would ultimately have to go to a Chinese physician if you could find one. The Chinese hospital was a great point of pride and still is rightfully today. Most people my age who were born in Chinatown were born here. This is a great place of pride and a great place of history and a great place of radiance for the community. Its history goes back to the Lagoon survey. And here we have Octavia and Lombard Street showing the old lagoon of which Lagoon uh, Street is named. And this water survey in the middle of a land grant, in fact, had the Chinese hospital and the Chinese laundry, a place you would send your clothes as an alternative to sending them to Hawaii to get your clothes washed. This Chinese hospital at this time of this 1859 map I have on the screen right now would have been so far out of town, it would have been two miles across the sandy dunes to get over here, but this was the site. So a, t uh, a, a hospital in Chinatown has great merit and is of great importance and of course is for a self-contained community. 
Um, with that, we also see temples and churches like St. Mary's and the Kong Chow. The Kong Chow, of course, is well documented. And for Cathcart, here's a photo taken from the Rust Building until 1964, the Rust Building on Bush at uh, Montgomery was the tallest building in the Western US and it had a viewing platform. Cathcart went up here many times and here we see him looking Northwest up across St. Mary's and there's Dr. Sun Yat-sen in the park and there's uh, St. Mary's Catholic Church and Sing Fat and Sing Chung on the corner. But in the foreground, we see the Kong Chow Temple. It's in the middle of the block. It has an entrance in, down an alcove off of Pine Street. But right down here is the Kong Chow Temple, torn down in 1950. That is a great document of old San Francisco. In fact, all of this block has changed greatly uh, since his time but everything above it still remains. So here we are at Pine Street and California Street uh, okay. at St. Mary's, and this is Grant Avenue and uh, Kearney. Uh, so um, we're looking to the Northwest towards Marin from the Rust Building, and we're at about 34th story. Uh, we also have an inclusion of restaurants and Hang Far Low still exists today. So these frames that you're showing us, these are all from the map. These are frames from the hundred and something frames that are inside the map. And yeah. you're showing us the relationship between the map and the story about Chinatown. Um, here we have Hang Far Low represented. It's an important local restaurant that's been used by predecessors, but also is used by him. Here we have a photograph of his uh, well-known host, B.S. Fong on the left uh, with his wife and other members of the community um, and we see an empty chair there, and we'll imagine uh, that that probably is Cathcart's chair. And this is uh, lunch on the second floor of Hang Far Low in about 1939. Um, with that, also his understanding of the importance of freedom of press, freedom of expression in Chinatown. At his time, we have a free Chinese Republic. Uh, it's 1937 through 1947. It is a time of friction uh, within Chinatown. Uh, the world is changing. Uh, we've gone through the Second World War. Um, freedom of expression is very important, remains so in the Chinese American community. And as such, the number of newspapers and documenting the day's news is very relevant, not wasted on him. Also, the fact that uh, political dissidents and opinion of the time is going to be right there on the walls. Uh, Cathcart is no shrinking violet to the realities of the day in the city that he lives. Um, he's also sensitive to the nuance of the culture, and this comes with time. Um, it's a sensitivity that has its limitations and that there are a certain number of uh, aesthetic or creative liberties that he takes uh, in the map that, that are simplifications uh, that are fully vetted by the Chinese American community at the time, but for our contemporary eye might be uh, uh, condescending or just overly simplified. Um, but with that, sometimes a jade heart needs to be overly simplified. You could write a doctoral thesis on the importance of jade and the types of jade in Chinese culture and the meaning and symbolisms behind having it in a heart shape. Um, as well as something like a vase, where you put the right vase at the right place with the right flowers is a fantastic thing, but you put the wrong vase with the wrong flowers at the wrong place, you could be incredibly insulting. So these nuances are not uh, wasted on Cathcart and are included in the map in great subtleties and explained to the best of our ability uh, with, with great sensitivity and enjoyment. Um, he's also taking note of uh, community and control. And with that, uh, what I mean is we see just a general grasp of the middle of the map and we see the Peace Society, which is an organization formed perhaps in the 19 teens to help resolve some of the issues between the Tongs and the battling family wars for control of everything from labor and workforce to drugs and prostitution. Um, with that comes the old bulletin board. The old bulletin board is in fact a bulletin board that was used by the community, a place where the tongs would make postings as far as prices on people's heads or declarations. It was also a place of general community uh, communication and unique to Chinatown in that regard. Um, it was an idea taken from in uh, great part in the 1906 earthquake and fire where people started sticking up things at Lotus Fountain after the 06 earthquake and fire trying to find each other. Uh, this was the expression of community and with it came uh, his, in fact, photographs of the very billboard of which we speak 
uh, and document uh, of an earlier Arnold Gente photograph documenting uh, the same type of thing, and postcards, in fact, of the exact corner uh, showing the exact thing 25, 30 years before that. Um, with that comes an acknowledgement of the place and uh, role of tongs and family associations, both for good and for bad, uh, and the control. Um, here we have uh, the Bing, King, uh, Bing Kong Tong. Um, this is the Freemasons, and this is in fact the people who protected Dr. Sun Yat-sen while he was here uh, in the ninth, early uh, 20th century, 1903-1909. Um, he had a price on his head and truly uh, had feared for his life, and so this is where he lived and was protected. Um, but it really is an acknowledgement as well. We see a lot of half characters that acknowledge the underworld. This is a, an, a, an acknowledgement of the hatchet wars that took place on Waverly Place between the Tongs in 1884 through 1887, um, and were well written about in Western newspapers as a point of both fascination as well as repugnation and condescension, um, but definitely a part of the underground and underbelly of Chinatown. Um, with that, we find also lots of familiar icons and celebrations. And here I saw this giant lunar moth in this map, and it was very central to the figure. And then I realized it had a couple of strings going down to it, and that went down to the, the park. And, that, and this, in fact, was not a giant moth, but it was a kite. And here we see again Cathcart and his creativity and documentation. He's taken a real life model. And here's a young man down at the Marina Green and the Marina Middle School, actually, backyard at a kite flying contest. And it is indeed a celebration. And so Cathcart is using his opportunity uh, to be a guest in Chinatown, living in close proximity and hired by the community to create this map, a cultural celebration of Chinatown post World War II post-Chinese Exclusion Act, vetted and presented by the six companies for public consumption and created by Kenneth Cathcart for your appreciation. It was unfamiliar to the public. It was unknown to us prior to our discovery. Um, and it has now been uh, discerned and deciphered and explained in this book, Gold Mountain Big City, available at Shine and Shine, which is our uh, website, uh, where we also sell or have a link for photographs uh, from the book. Um, Cathcart's photographic collection was 3,500 images, and all of those have been digitized and posted on our site for people to review and enjoy. They're predominantly San Francisco, uh, North Beach, Chinatown, Waterfront, uh, as well as some Western edition. The book is available at all your local bookstores, and if you have a favorite, please do support them in any way that you can. Amazon does have it as well, and, uh, and I've seen it for as little as 20 bucks when they have a special on it. So whatever uh, works for you, I hope you'll think about buying this marvelous book. It includes a fold-out edition of the map in the back. And so you actually have a copy of the map included with it, uh, as well as uh, uh, a full explanation of, of what you got there. So Ron, thank you so much for the opportunity to kind of tell you about the book and, and explain in brief detail. Uh, I had to edit things down and keep it moving. The book has 177 icons. Each of those is a story. And, and, and indeed, a couple of those stories, people have their doctoral thesis on. That's how much you could write about it. So there's a lot of, lot of information. I hope you'll enjoy it. Terrific. Thanks so much, uh, Jimmy. Great to uh, enjoy your uh, great story with us. Few questions. When were the first Chinese people, uh, when did the first Chinese people come to San Francisco? So the first Chinese immigrants was 1848, and it was Mayor John Geary who celebrated the China Boys in a letter, open letter to the community uh, and the uh, extent of the Chinese immigrants who came and were a labor force that both saluted him at the parade uh, for 1848, I believe. Um, and uh, so that letter is an acknowledgement of the Chinese immigrants in San Francisco and is celebrated by the Chinese community as the first acknowledgement in the community. And that's very important. So did the Chinese come because they were a low cost labor force? Is that why they were brought to uh, San Francisco? You know, there was some of that, but in fact, there were several factors that I think would have brought the Chinese immigrant here. One was the suffering uh, of the Qin dynasty under the extraction of taxes by the British after the Opium Wars, right? So basically the Qin dynasty is broke. And if you're not from the right place, you're gonna be paying that debt. Uh, to Britain on behalf of royalty. This drove many people into poverty and starvation, and those factors would have had some contribution to a great number of people. But originally, 
uh, it was a, a matter of proximity and availability and that there was trade being established and with trade came boats and with vessels came opportunity to to explore or get away. Escape yeah. the turmoil in China. Escape yeah. poverty in many cases. Um, the, the, the politics were often above the head of, of the uh, average person, um, but a, a, an indenturement could allow one to in fact have somebody pay your way uh, and you would then be working for them when you got here. So uh, that type of indenturement was not uncommon at all. In many cases, many, many hundreds, if not thousands of young women were lured here into the sex trade uh, uh, by uh, misdirection uh, through this process. So um, you were taking a great risk uh, by becoming indentured at that time, but it was in fact um, the opportunity of economic employment and the possibility of, of being able to work and actually have uh, that as a simple goal because there was no work there. When was Chinatown founded and why at that location? So uh, Chinatown uh, started uh, on Sacramento Street, uh, a one block uh, running between Grant and Stockton and it gradually expanded to the space that we know it today as other businesses rescinded that area and moved to other areas. As the financial district grew, businesses that were once right on the waterfront at Portsmouth Square were now four blocks from the waterfront, and so they moved down to the waterfront because we did landfill and filled the waterfront. Um, so Chinatown became a, a process of attrition and the, the yielding of space uh, to a growing community. With the falling of the railway or end of the railway business uh, for construction, a lot of people came back to Chinatown. What year was it founded? You know, uh, 1848 is the first land grant for Chinese, uh, and that's actually on Washington Street. Um, so we have first Chinese documentation here just prior to the gold rush or at the time of the gold rush. So there's six companies. Um, briefly, what are the six companies? Why is it six? Um, six companies is a, is a colloquialism for six families that conjoined forces early on in the 1850s. Um, uh, many and much of Chinese business is done by family name. And these six families created the six companies and they um, attained a great deal of attention because they became the main go-between between between Chinese community and the European American community. So when Leland Stanford needed Chinese immigrants to work the railway, he hired them through the six companies. And that's really who they are. So when, when things were being imported from China to America, what were the objects that Americans were buying from China? You know, it's interesting because the Chinese goods were phenomenal. We have to remember that the porcelains, the silks, the ivories, the jades, the stone carving, in fact, many of the wares documented in the book and in Cathcart's articulations it, it, as late as 1950 are very, very high quality goods, goods that today we would have in museums. Um, these are pieces that had great popularity because um, this is a period of, of mystique and an idea of orientalis, that which is Asian or of the Eastern Orient was very exotic, right? Give us some sense about the population growth of China, Chinese people in San Francisco. Um, do you have any metrics on how many people lived here at the time of the earthquake, how many Chinese people lived here at the time of the earthquake at the beginning of World War II? Any, any particular case? Yeah, you know, I, I can't throw around a lot of exact figures on that. At the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act map of 1885, um, they documented by going in the front door of houses without permission and counting beds and assigning three people minimum, as many as five, to a bed because they found that people were sleeping in shifts and that in fact a, a household could have as many as 20 uh, members with as few as seven beds. So um, this was the process and there was 32,000 in the confines of the map as documented. So you could not live outside of those 30 square or, or uh, there wasn't even 30, it was 13 square city blocks. Um, that was 30,000 people. As the community was allowed to loosen up. Where was that now? That was 1885. And that was after the return of a great number of people at the end of the big work projects like the building of the Delta and the building of the railways. Um, the community at the time of the earthquake was probably something uh, by that time uh, very close to 27 to 35,000 still. Uh, and this was a time when of course it burned to the ground and uh, the powers that be tried to push yeah, the Chinese out. 
Chinatown burning the ground? What burned the ground? What China, well, the whole city, uh, technically, 1906, anything uh, yeah. east of Van Ness burned to the ground. Chinatown yeah. is in the middle of that. They own the real estate. They were uh, almost relegated to the Bayview Hunters Point. And with great zeal and effort, they were the first to raise funds, hire the architects, and break ground on the reconstruction of their neighborhood in cl staking claim for that which had been historically theirs by that time. Um, in doing so, they also added something that didn't exist, which is all those uh, architecturally peaked roofs and all that Chinesey architecture. That, in fact, was designed by the Chinese at their request to emulate something that didn't maybe exist, but what existed in the minds of Europeans and European Americans as being Chinese. And so uh, uh, the architecture firm, in fact, did these things at the request of the community so that they would appear more Chinese. It was good for business. So um, first of all, for our, our viewers, uh, Jimmy's maps and photographs are so incredibly unique. It's wonderful having gone to the store when it was on Grand Street before he was purely online. Uh, I have to just tell everybody that uh, his collection of maps is really unparalleled in San Francisco. So tell me, Jimmy, in the online world, how do you sell a map when people grab things, just sort of uh, copy them offline all the time? Do you put a watermark on maps? How do you do yeah. it? Yeah. You know, um... Our photographs are good enough and have a high enough resolution for the collector and viewer to see the question and answer the questions. Um, if somebody wants to emulate that, you know, more power to them. If they need to have that copy, uh, they could probably just reach out to me and I would probably just give them a scan of it. Um, many maps we copy and digitize. We deal in original material. And because uh, the 1855 or the 1955 map are both out of print and I have them both, um, Owning the original thing is is sometimes what you want, and if it if it isn't, then you know we want to support that as well. Um, I've had a great time with digital maps the last number of years, and I've learned from maps that I've had my whole life. But because they were digital, I could blow them up large enough I could actually see things. So um, we've had good success. Um, people reach out to us via email. We have over seven thousand maps, and every day Marty and I engage, and that is said to say enable and photograph fifty of them. And so of those 7,000 maps right now, I'm at about mm, 500. And by the end of next week, it'll be 1,000. And then, you know, so you see how it goes. So congratulations on the book being published by Thank Abrams. You. That's really, really, really wonderful. Yes, uh, published by Cameron Press out of Petaluma. And Abrams bought them specifically based on the quality of the books that they produce. They had been their distributor and they said, you know, you guys do good stuff. And then books by Lee Bruno and um, books by Charles Fracchia, books by myself and really well-researched and great, great publications. So Abrams has been marvelous as well as Cameron Press. Um, thank you for mentioning them. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So now San Francisco, the site of the first Chinatown in America, is so well known to us, but to the average Chinese person, if you go over to the uh, 1.3 billion folks that live in mainland China, are they familiar with a Chinatown in San Francisco or the <laughs> Chinatown in New York? You know, it's interesting. Um, if you're a modern Chinese person, a person who's grown up in China, you come to San Francisco's Chinatown and you don't know what the hell that is. It looks so old world, so like backwards. So like, yeah, this doesn't look like China because China doesn't look like that. It doesn't look like that anymore. And ultimately, it is a amalgam of Chinese American creation. Um, it is marvelous. And so uh, if you're not a San Franciscan, who you don't like the familiarity of it to us is just so familiar and so ingrained to who we are. Um, but if you're not, don't have that, it is a queer bird. It is unusual. It is strange looking. Um, and, and that's that's kind of fun. Uh, I've had a great number of, of visitors from, from mainland uh, in the last 20 years who said, wow, walking through Chinatown is like walking back in time for us. And this is really special, you know, that's nice. They're, they've also the kind of place who find our map store. So they're obviously interested in history and they're seeing history as they go along. Right? San Francisco's Chinatown is filled with history. So having, uh, as I mentioned before, a great appreciation for Jimmy's, um, uh, you know, sense for these things. What percentage of all your product now that you're selling is maps and what percent are photographs? Because you have incredibly rare maps and rare photographs. 
Yeah, you know, um, maps are, are still our mainstay and what we're working on. The photographs are uh, self-maintaining. We've digitized them all. They're on the site. Uh, it's click and point, uh, click to pay. It couldn't be simpler. And they're uh, created by Bay Photo, who's down in Santa Cruz and shipped directly to the consumer. So um, those are fantastic because the images are so great. And I, I don't have to, because I don't have to work as hard now, I did five years of hard labor on that to get all that happening. But because they kind of take care of itself, um, the maps are my main focus because I have to write every day and try to get these active and get them on the website, write the metadata and, and make sure um, somebody will find them. Once they're up, they're up. They're part of our inventory. And until I barcode and read them out, they'll be there. Um, also, the website has uh, uh, signed copies of the book. So if people are interested in the book and they want to buy one from our store, um, then the ones that I ship off are signed. And uh, that's fun. So the Chinese who came here and started business, why did they start laundries? And when was the first one of these? So laundry was one of the laborious trades that was not restricted by the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, uh, they had a process, uh, two processes. One is an understanding of some basic alchemy. And so things like starch and things uh, that created cleanliness like lye were incorporated already into Chinese laundry practices. Um, so uh, immediately there was work available. It's, an, it's a pioneer town without laundry. You know, there's the old joke, you could, and it's, it's true. You could send your laundry to the laundress and it would take a month to get it back, which meant you could either send it to the laundress in Chinatown or you could send it to Hawaii. It would sail there, it would take a week, it would be washed, it would sail back. And, and they cost about the same. And that's exactly what they did in the 1860s. But the fact is, is laundry was so important because of its non-exclusion. If you simply had a wash tub and water, this is a very low incorporative initial cost to start a business. You can start something with as little as a borrowed wash tub and you are making money. And this was very important, the creation of wealth, the creation of commerce. And then of course, uh, just to extrapolate a little bit, I wanted to say family laundries in Chinatown are the backbone of Chinatowns in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, and in Chicago, probably in Phoenix too. Not just because of the work, but because of the family assembly and the work that it provided and the kind of work and the extemporaneous extended family that was hired through that it was very important. So lastly, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Why uh, was the Chinese Exclusion Act and what did it, how did it work? So it's truly a subject that people do have their doctoral thesis on. I don't want to oversimplify it, but in short, um, around the 1870s, a man by the name of Dennis Kearney was pro-Irish labor. These were the new immigrants. This was the new cheap labor. The Irish were uh, degraded and denigrated by the English and were subject to ditch digging at best. But ditch digging, there was a lot of it. And the Chinese have been doing the ditch digging. And so Kearney and Kearney has put uh, on the ballot and in place measures and anti-Chinese sentiment. People who followed Dennis Kearney's philosophy of exclusion and bigotry were Kearneyists. And so, but, and San Francisco was a city and, and City Hall was being infiltrated and dominated by Kearneyists. And so um, with that came the fear of the return of the Chinese after the finishing of the Great Works Project. So the railways weren't done really fully until the 1880s, the Delta in the middle of the 1870s. And so by 1875, Chinatown is getting pretty packed. And the ability of getting a labor guy cheap who's Chinese is pretty good. And he's competing with the new Irish immigrant who's living out in the mission and south of market. And this is against Kearney's wishes. And so this is really the political force behind it. Like I said, the map of the Board of Supervisors, nothing's illegal, it's all immoral. So it was a moralist position. And as we see us come into the 20th century, you see San Francisco become less egalitarian, less sophisticated, less diverse, and become more bigoted and more centrist and more centrist on ideas that are exclusionary for the protection of the monopolistic businesses that we have. That was the nature of San Francisco in many regards from the 1880s through the 1920s. And those things turned around, and, uh, but those were the realities. And so that's the biggest part of how it came about. Its repeal came after great effort, and it truly wasn't fully gone until 1964 when the Supreme Court said, you can't count things one way for one group of people and count things another way for another group of people. That just isn't how it works. And so with that, um, we have a more balanced rule and set of systems since 1964 and the civil rights legislations put down at that time. And 
fully decapitating and ending that legislation. That's the long and short of it. So Jimmy Shine of Shine and Shine, antique prints, maps, um, and photographs. It's just our pleasure to uh, have you speak at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. And with that, the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon is adjourned. Thank you, sir. It's great to be here. Thank you for joining the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, where we ask that you always stay curious. This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.